they they say, okay, there's a social rights so okay, let, let kids um, be done now. Um, I think that's it.
Does the church say? Amen. I'd like to greet you all again in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, my name is Leah Nigeria and I will be the program director for today. Um, as you all know that today is Stewardship Day and uh, one of the key um, factors of being a good steward is managing your time. So we have titled our program today, 24 Hours. As human beings, we have all been allotted a specific amount of time. What are we doing with that time? Every day we are given the opportunity to take advantage of 24 hours. We, what we make um, of that time, we can either make it to improve ourselves and also those around us. How, we, how are we managing that time? Being a good steward means um, of our time is what, oh, sorry, being good stewards of our time is one of life's major responsibilities. The Lord encourages us in his word to make most of our time, keeping in mind that the days are evil. Unquestionably, the use that we make of our time has a, a, a profound impact on us. It can determine who we are and what we become. That is why, just like Moses, we should make the following request to God. Teach us to number our days that we gain a heart of wisdom. This is also why God has, amongst other reasons, reserved himself some time in each week, the Sabbath. According to Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11, during the six remaining days we are expected to occupy ourselves with activities that are useful to us and those around us. But the Sabbath is exclusively for God. As we enjoy the program, which is entitled 24 Hours, we pray that you learn something that will help you manage your time efficiently. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we sing a song? Can we sing a song?
Happy to all in the mighty name of our Lord dear Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 <laughs> when you come to managing money, many use the fact that they do not have much money as an excuse for being poor stewards for their finances. Yet others who have much money don't know how to manage it. And it is true, not everyone has the same amount of money, but we all have 24 hours a day. Like money, it is possible for us to spend most of our time on our own interests. We have time to study, we go to parties, we watch TV, and sometimes we spend hours in front of the computer serving the internet. How much time do we have for God? Let us see what the Bible has to say about time management. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1. And it says, To everything is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Thank you. Church. To understand the value of a millisecond, talk to an athlete who has won a silver medal in the Olympics. Morning, church. To understand the value of a year, talk to a person who has failed the final exam. To understand the value of of a month, talk to a mother who has given birth to a premature baby. To understand the value of a week, talk to a editor of a weekly publication. To understand the value of a second, talk to a person who has survived a and accident. Good morning, Jess. To understand the value of a minute, ask talk to someone that has missed a bus train or train. To understand the value of an hour, talk to a couple who come here to meet again. In the 24 hours of the day, the seven weeks of a week, the seven days of a week, and the 12 months of a year, which all add up to 365 days in most years, let us take time to work and to work hard, for that's the price for success. Let us take time to think, for that's the source of power. Let us take time to love, because that is God's giving privilege. Let us take time to play, for that is the secret for eternal youth. Let us take time to read, for that is the foundation of wisdom. Let us take time to dream, because that is the best way to soar and reach for the stars. Let us take time to make friends, because that is the way to sprinkle happiness in our lives. Let us take time to appreciate those around us, because life is too short to be selfish. Let us take time to laugh, because we, laughter is the music to the soul. Thank you. Good morning, church. After so much gospel has been, has been preached, I don't, I don't even know if I should still speak. For the, sake of, for, uh, for the sake of being loyal to the team, I suppose I would have to also give my five minutes. I invite the church to please come with me to the book of to the book of Second Kings. The book of Second Kings, I'll uh, be reading on this uh, on, on chapter six. The book of Second Kings, chapter six. The book of 2 Kings chapter 6, as we see, 
Um, how much can you contribute to us the topic? The topic being 24 hours and within the context of stewardship. I'll be reading really here. Now the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, Behold, now the place before you where we are living is too limited for us. Verse 2, Please let us go to the Jordan, and each of us take from there a bill, and let us make a place there for ourselves where we may live. So he said, Go. Verse 3, Then one said, Please be willing to go with your servants. And he answered, I shall go. So he went to them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down the trees. But as one was filling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, my master, for it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did he fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there, and made the iron to float. He said, Take it out for yourself. So he put out his hand and took it. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. We hear from the scripture that there was a group of men, the sons of the prophets, who said to Elijah that we, we, we need to go somewhere. Perhaps the place that they were stationed at didn't have bigger houses, or perhaps they didn't have enough shelter. So that's why they perhaps um, had asked him to, they asked for permission to go and cut the trees. Perhaps they wanted to build more houses. We don't know all the huts. And when we get to verse 3, we hear that they are asking the men of God to please come with them. And just as a footnote to the church, I would like to, I suggest that uh, we, we, we need to be mindful of who we, we take along when you're going on a journey. We need to be mindful of who we're surrounding ourselves with. We need to be mindful of who we're inviting to come along with us as we take the journey towards our dreams. We need to be mindful of who we surround ourselves with. Perhaps around the things, the issues of our families, the issues of, um, of our dreams, our aspirations, our plans. We, need, we just need to be mindful of who we take along. Because there are some people who might be with you, but they are not for you. There might be people who might be with you, but they are secretly um, speaking against you, or they're gossiping about you, or they're even praying against you. That's why an African man sometimes says, don't tell other people your dreams, don't share your dreams with other people, because there are people who, who don't wish that we succeed in life. And then as we go to, as we get to verse 5, we, we hear the, the Bible tells us that as one was filling a beam, in other words, as one was about to cut one of the trees, the head of an axe fell into the water. And we hear the man of God crying, Alas, my master, for he was borrowed. Now the problem here is not that the axe fell into the water. The problem is that the axe was borrowed. That's the problem. And perhaps we could pitch a small tent here, right here, and speak about our theme for today. The things that are borrowed. The ex was borrowed. We also have time that was borrowed to us. We have precious time that was borrowed to us by God. We have our families that have been borrowed to us by God. We have our careers that have been borrowed to us by our God. We have our minds that have been borrowed to us by our God. We even have the future that has been born to us by God. One of the speaker has said here that we, 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 we need to be, we need to dream because it is through the wings that we get from the dreams that we manage to soar and achieve our dreams. Even the dreams that we have in our conscience are borrowed. We live in one borrowed time. The 24 hours that we have, that is also the theme that we have today, is a, is a borrowed 24 hours. What do you do with the 24 hours that has been borrowed to us? Alas, my master, it was borrowed. What do we do with the 24 hours that has been borrowed to us? Then on verse 6, we hear that the man of God said, Where did he fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron flow. This is God. 
This is God asking us. Perhaps you might have messed up with your dreams. You might have messed up with your life. You might have messed up with your families. You might have messed up with your marriage. You might have messed up with a career. You might have messed up with the time that you had at university. One of the speakers here said that if you want to know the value of a year, you must ask the student who has just failed the final exam. You might have messed up. You might have messed up with the 24 hours. The addictions, the secret addictions that we have. They mess up our 24 hours. We don't, we, you, the, uh, the day comes to an end and you look back and you don't see what you have done with the 24 hours. We have messed up. What do we do then? The Lord says, where did it fall? Where did the iron head fall? Has it fallen into the deep of the Jordan River? Has it fallen into the deep of our ignorance, our laziness perhaps? Has it fallen into the deep of our, our stresses, our depression? Has our dreams fallen deep into the, into the river Jordan? What do you do then? God is asking you, where did it, what happened to it? Where did it fall? And we hear the man of God cutting off the stick and throwing it, throwing it into the river and let the iron to flow. God is in the rest in, in, in God is in the business of restoration. God is in the business of restoring that which has been lost. So whatever has been lost it could be your 24 hours. It could be um, it could be the energy of of being productive within your 24 hours. God is asking, where did it fall? Whatever has happened to us, whatever is happening to us, God is in the business of restoring our 24 hours. Just cry out to Him and say, it has fallen right here, and God will know what to do with it. We hear that the man of God cut a stick and threw it into the river and made the axe to float. This is God taking taking us out of, out of the deep muddy clay, taking us out and putting His hand or putting His grace and mercy and pulling us out to the surface so that we can float. This is what God does with us. This is what God does to us. This is what God does for us. And then when you get to verse 7, we say, we, 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 we hear the man of God say, take it up for yourself. So he put out his hand and took it. God can save your marriage, but he will not love your partner for you. God can save your career, but he will not sit and invest in it productive into the world. God can find a job for you, but he will not go and speak for you at an interview. He will not go and do the actual job for you. God can, uh, God can save our kids, God can save our children, but he will not love our children for us. He will not speak to our children for us. He will not gather the kids out of the table and pray for them. Us. We need to pick the right head for ourselves. That's the responsibility that the best is telling us this morning. So I pray that if there's anything that we might forget, um, we, we, we at least remember this. We at least remember the responsibility that God is presenting unto us this morning with our 24 hours. What do you do with the 24 hours? Is it lost? Has God helped you to take it out of the deep muddy clay to make it float on the river Jordan? When he has done that, then what happens? What do you do then with your 24 hours? It is our responsibility to start reading. We need to read books that build us. We need to speak to people that build us. We need to surround ourselves with friends that are for us. We need to try and pray for our thoughts. To do away with the negative thoughts so that God can sanctify us and cleanse us so that we can have a productive 24 hours again. It is my prayer that the church remembers that we are living in a 24 hours, the borrowed 24 hours, borrowed time, borrowed this, borrowed that, borrowed marriage, borrowed church, borrowed friends, borrowed minds, and borrowed hearts. What do we do with the board of X? Amen. Amen. Perhaps there's a special item, I'm not sure. Amen.
Are we able to broadcast for everyone? No signal. Not yet. All right. Okay, since... Are we good? 75. Doing it in Shona. All right. We're doing it in Shona today. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. If I sound like I'm saying things I shouldn't be saying in the church, please forgive me. <laughs>
what I found to be a challenge is that you find that you go there, whether it's personal ministers leader or the youth, because these were done you know, uh, in conjunction with other departments, and whether the children's ministry as well. They'll go there and identify a need. And you might find that the budget for that event might require us to raise, say, 20,000 rand. And then we'll come to the church and ask for contributions. The unfortunate thing is that we hardly are able to contribute the funds required. And the church will then have to subsidize. In other words, it's a struggle to plan for and, and raise funds for those outreach programs that we plan as a church. In other words, it's, it's easier again to contribute towards a specific project like church building. We normally come up here and encourage our members to contribute towards the church building. And, and at times it's much easier when you see that we have identified land and that in other ways there's tangible results and also whereby there's already you know construction that has started taking place and people are then more encouraged to contribute but when it comes to mission it's something that unfortunately we do neglect so today's offer day is to encourage us not only to look at the needs of the local church per se but also contribute to watch towards the global outreach programs uh, as this is our strategy as well as we move church. Uh, if I remember when we started going through one of the things amongst others was also to not only concentrate on enrich but also to touch the world out there. As much as it is difficult, I remember the other day around the area where we used to worship, the Chinese school. We tried to go around that community. There were locked gates, literally. Uh, big dogs that when we even approached them with the flyer, you, you pray that actually this gate could open, what would happen to them? You know, yeah, it, it was scary. Uh, but yeah, we made the Lord that really help us and, and, and assist us to, to not only concentrate on what our immediate needs are, yes, we do have immediate needs, local church, uh, paying for all the expenses that we can on a day-to-day, -day, rental, etc. Our regular and systematic, systematic mission offerings are like giving life, are like a life-giving river with tributaries flowing around the world carrying refreshing water to mission fields. Tributaries, when I look at the definition, it says it's a small river flowing into a larger river or lake. So that's what our mission contributions are like. You might not see the impact now, the impact, but it reaches out to the larger world. I was watching TV the other day, and, and I saw that some areas they even talk about scholarships, you know, the funds that we contribute. They talk about scholarships, uh, but yet I know you are not yet there. Uh, you might think, hey, people are even using the money that we contribute to fund students to study, and yet we are still battling with basic issues, uh, the stomach issues, uh, shelter, etc. And I know it's a difficult choice, but in our offering, let us not only neglect other needs of the greater church. Let us close our eyes as we pray. Dear God, thank you for speaking to us this morning. We thank you for your love, we thank you for your patience, and we thank you for your protection, Lord. We thank you for speaking to us and reminding us of our stewardship, Lord. Help us to sustain ourselves during these difficult times and more importantly, help us to always remember to contribute to the bigger mission of the church. All this we ask 
in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As the offering is being taken, let us together sing number 79. We'll be doing it in Isi Zulu, number 79. I am a man of 
about Tony Abba. Why are you here? I think there's a song we should sing to see whether we are really here for what we are here for. In my corvalenda of woman is all no. 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 In my
as it affects our finances. And I hope you remember. And then we then dive into what then are the four pillars of financial stewardship. We, 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 we spoke at length about wealth. We spoke about budgeting, we spoke about debt, we spoke about, we spoke about emergencies, and then we spoke about investing. If you don't remember, you ask those who were there. But, but you know, all of these things could just be clear. You know, we, we didn't get a chance at that time, because it was the early days of 2020, to test whether what we learned can be put into practice. And of course, COVID gave us an opportunity to test. If the lessons taught in this pulpit can be applied practically, can God's word be trusted to be applicable practically? If we have time, we are going to go through and see that those who actually survive financially is because they follow what we are teaching the last time we met. So it has been proven that it can work. And, and then we dive into what then, what is the spirit of stewardship? And we, we shared that the spirit of stewardship is love. And we said it's love for God, love for self, love for your neighbor. Hence, we read the, 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 the book of Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. And then we spent some time discussing tithe. Um, and, and we said tithe is really a response out of love and gratitude. That's why we don't pay tithe to return it. And, 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 and we said that tithe gives us an opportunity to realize that it is God who gives us the ability we read from Deuteronomy chapter, chapter, chapter 18. It is God who gives us the ability to generate wealth. And we also read that tithe gives us an opportunity to see God at work, to realize that nothingness does not intimidate God. We're not sustained by things, we're sustained by God. And we shared a few verses that show that when there was nothing and we had God, we had everything. Because we looked at creation and said, God took nothing and made everything. So nothingness is a raw material for creation. So it shouldn't intimidate. We spent some time there and we said something about offering. But, but I want us to continue on that, on that vein and take a different angle uh, around. Because we said it's about love for God, love for yourself, but also love for your neighbor. That's what stewardship is. And, and I like the, 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 the offering reading because it touched on the issue of mission. And, and today I want us to to talk on an issue, a very simple issue that we have oversimplified yet it's more complex. Loving your neighbor is to love yourself. And, 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 and you find that, and, and of course, we, when you read Mark chapter 12, verse 20, we started with the sermon, I, 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 I don't have long with it. We started, so. If, if not, I put it into it. No, so, so we say more money, maybe it's switch on, I don't know, just wait to be created. Um, no. I greet you. Mark chapter 12. <laughs> and, and, now, now the thing with Jesus is that he really irritated a lot of people who thought they were smarter than everybody else. Because he, he challenged the status quo. And therefore, every opportunity they got to prove that this guy is not who he is, they took it. They took it with debates, they took it with threats that they said uh, when, 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 when they, they came, they caught somebody in the act as if she was in the act alone and they were setting a trap for this. They always took an opportunity and this is one of those in Mark chapter 12 verse 28. It says, now one of the scribes had come and had this debate and noticing how well, have, have you noticed, I, I, I don't know, I'm not saying this to my church, but that's me. When I say my church, I mean the church I belong to. There's no ownership. No, it's in my... There's my ownership, there's my belonging, so that's, that's the one I'm talking about. And, 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 and you know, sometimes when, when, when we do an afternoon program, we do a presentation, somebody then asks you a question, but they know the answer, they're just testing you. And I always just say, if you know the answer to your question, state it as an opinion, just tell us, tell us the answer, don't do yourself out. Now here, these guys come and they ask Christ a question to test him. And to, because they've seen how well it's answered, and they say, no, 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 this guy, we will catch him this time, but let's set a trap for him. And, and therefore, they ask the question, and they say, um, uh, in, in, which commandment is the most important of all? Now, this was a test, because how, how dare do you choose amongst the ten that Moses has given and choose your own? So, call and touch. And of course, Jesus replies, and he says, this is the most... Now, look at this answer. They ask him for one, he gives them a bonus too. And then Jesus says, this is the most important one. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord of, of, of our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And then he says, here's the bonus. The second one is this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. No other commandment is greater than this. What does this have to do with stewardship? And we said that stewardship is, is centered on love. Love for God. And that's when we, we talk about devotion, getting closer to, to Jesus, and also your tithing and all of that when it comes to financial side. But love for yourself. We don't say that God, you know, you've seen in other churches where the whole congregation is poor, but the bishop has a private plane. We don't serve a God who's out to look out for himself. That's why he says, love yourself too. And then he says, now that you know how to love yourself, that love reflects it for your name. And that is stewardship. Love for God, love for self, love for your name. We don't serve a God who wants us to neglect ourselves, so we prove that we love him. That's why in the greatest commandment, there's love self-love is there. But we are focusing on, 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 on loving your neighbor. We've spoken about self-love the last time we met. And then, um, and then, of course, no other commandment is greater than this. And then, right, you shall describe the, the reply. You have answered correctly that God is one and love him and all of those things. Um, and then, of course, when Jesus saw that the man had answered wisely, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one gets to question him in heaven. Now, what does it mean to love your neighbor as you love yourself? And what does it mean in the context of the church? I was hoping my, my clicker here would work, but it's, it's confusing, so I'm going to just keep doing it. Let, let's talk about poverty a little bit, because it's, it's one of the things that we grapple with as a society and as a church inside a society. If you think about the impact of poverty, and, and we'll, we'll see what this has to do with stewardship. In, in South Africa, when they define someone as poor, and, and I want you to see how, how ridiculous it is and how a, a, a little contribution, things that we take for granted can change someone's life. In South Africa, when we talk about poverty, we then say that anybody, we've got, we've got the upper bound poverty line. We say that anybody who, who has less than 1,385 is, is, is in the upper bound of the poverty line. In other words, if I have 1,400, I'm not recognized as poor. <laughs> Now many of us know that 1,400, we finish it in one sitting on an evening without even noticing. Or, or maybe, or maybe on, our, on, our, on, our, on, our, on our data, or the data is the data, I don't know, I don't know, some of them are And therefore, and this 1,300, they said it's the threshold uh, for someone to, to afford the minimum desired lifestyle by most South Africans. Now, now you are thinking, this can't be, but we are not most South Africans. Most South Africans, 1,300 makes them feel like they are rich. That's how bad the situation is. Then the, the church operates in this world, in this country. And of course, they say that there's a no amount where you have to choose between food and something else that is important, non-food items. And then there's the food poverty line. Now you know that 620 rents, you don't even remember what you did with it yesterday. And that's a definition for, that, that makes it different for somebody to determine whether they sleep hungry or full. Things you take for granted. That's how we define poverty. In fact, in South Africa, maybe, maybe graphs are a problem. In South Africa, poverty is such that 55% are justified for what poverty is. 55% of this population in this country lives in poverty. But that's the poverty that's been defined by 1,300. But we know that even at 10,000, we are poor. So the numbers are even worse. That is the job that, that, is, that is available for stewards, right? But I love the way the United Nations has decided to redefine poverty. Because poverty is not just about rents and cents. Poverty is, is, is much more um, um, multi-dimensional. Multi -dimensional. And they then recognize that poverty, you must think about these things. The issue of health. The issue of education. Because what does money do? Money is a tool. And you know what tools are? Tools, tools, if you think about a brick, a brick in the hands of a builder can build a structure like this, isn't it? But then of course in the head of a criminal can also hurt somebody. So tools can turn into weapons. So 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 money is a tool, but it, it, it finds its meaning in terms of what like I, I apply it to. So, for example, the issue of health, the issue of education, the issue of living standard, the issue of economic activity. They started realizing that poverty is not just about money. 
I love this because it is beautiful. Because it then says that to make a difference in someone's life, it doesn't only have to do with giving them money. And that's what we are called for as two. And that is why when, when we read the Bible, and the Bible gives us a hint of what's important to a human being when it talks about how Jesus was growing. And it says, and the, and, and, and the boy Jesus grew in stature, the physical side, in favor with men socially, in favor with God and in wisdom. Now you can see that human beings are multidimensional, they're not just our food. And therefore, when we look at our programs in terms of how we intervene as a change, as a church and change people's lives, many of the programs that we consume alone inside church can change people's lives without costing us a cent. Right. And of course, that is why then, when we are then saying we are attending to loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, think about yourself. You, you, you care about your spiritual life. Do that for your neighbor. You care about your mental health. Do that for your neighbor. You care about your physical. Do that for your neighbor. You care about your social, being able to have a family, being able to... If you were to look at what poverty has done to families, you will realize that part of the act of stewards and the church is to also intervene. The family life problems that we have are part of helping those who are poor. But we just consume them for ourselves. And we read a few verses of, of telling us what God expects of us when it comes to loving our neighbors and loving ourselves. If you think about what, what this multi-dimensional poverty means in the world, then from that definition, the statistics then are telling us that 1.3 billion people in this world are poor. And most of the poor, this is 85%, 85% comes from South Asia, your Pakistan, your India, and Sub-Saharan Africa, which is us, Zimbabwe, and a few other countries. And that's where poverty happens. And God has placed us here as a church. And our job is big. And, 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 it's, and it's more than just, just debating a few things about ourselves. Our job is bigger than that. But I want us to remember that the solution to poverty has to be multidimensional. The programs that we do for ourselves should be the programs that we take to those who consider poor. Because because of poverty, they don't have access to the things that we have. The things that we love for ourselves. If the Bible is true, if it says love your neighbors, love yourself, means that those things must be done for the poor also. Right. And of course, as if the Bible needed to make some emphasis, it says that in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11, it says there will always be the poor amongst you. In other words, you will always have work to do as a church. There's never going to be a time where the work is really important. And we remember later on, Jesus uses the same quotation, but he was dealing with something that sometimes we, we don't get as a church. Now, there, there's some of us, you know, I, 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 I used to talk about the concept of, 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 of being lazy by being busy. Where there are things you need to attend to, but you rather be busy with other things so that you ignore attending them. So of course, there, 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 there is also a danger in a church where we want to then stop being Christians and spiritual and forget our mission because we want to be activists. And that's all now we want to do. And then, therefore, when 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 when, when Mary was anointing the feet of Jesus, remember that they commented that the oil is expensive, and they started saying, no, 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 but that oil could have been used for the poor. And then Jesus, the poor will always be amongst you. Me now, I'm not going to be here forever. And the point Jesus was then saying that some of us then want to ignore spirituality because we want to act like activists, and we say it's for Jesus because it's in the Bible. Then he says, yes, the poor will always be amongst you. You will always have that job, but don't forget that you are still a spiritual house. But that doesn't mean that we then ignore poverty. Both, we must integrate our spirituality with helping the world. That's what Jesus was then saying. But I'm, I'm just passing by that. I want to show you the highest standard that is expected of stewards when it comes to loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Look at what the Bible says when the first church was established, when Abraham was called and, and he's told that we're going to be a great nation. Now the Bible says, and the verse is in front of you, we're reading Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. It says that through you, nations will be blessed. In other words, in other words you, you, you will arrive in an area that has poverty, but because you exist, the poverty should end. You, you will arrive at a place where the standard and the quality of education is so low, but because you exist. Now, now if you want to look at the, the progress of the other church, 
Now, I'm challenging you because many of us, many of us grew up as, as, as pathfinders, but all we were doing, we were doing knots, and then we were doing uh, uh, clubs, and then we were doing and then we were doing and then we were doing and then but, but, but I challenge you to go into the depths of the pathfinder owners that we've got there. You realize that this church has a solution. I mean, there's a pathfinder on us for being a mechanic. There's a pathfinder on us for artificial intelligence that was developed by the North American Division in 2014. There's a pathfinder on us for booking all the skills that are in shortage that could create employment or make people employed are in this church. When the Bible says, through you, nations shall be, shall, 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 shall be blessed, it's because God has equipped us. That's why Elmer Martin Christ of the says, says that his, his beatings are his enemies. In other words, when he commands us to do something, it is because the commandment can't pray to do the power to do. But we just set up something. We think it's an issue of budget. I'm going to come to the budget because we must talk about money also. But, but then, and, and, and then as if, as if God knew that we have some problem, no, but our circumstances, our circumstances. I want you to remember Joseph. In other words, the commandment that through you nation must be blessed, must be blessed does not depend on how horrible your personal circumstances are. Joseph is there as a prisoner. Joseph is accused of 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 of, 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 of um, what 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 is this? Um, of, of, of sexual abuse. He's, a, he's, a, he's accused of, of, of raping Potiphar's, Potiphar's um, wife. And then he's thrown into prison. But he doesn't stop being a blessing wherever he is. He doesn't say, I'm in prison, uh, nothing must be expected of me. Inside the prison, it becomes a blessing. And the expectation is that inside your tough situation, your mission does not stop. That's what stewards do. They don't make excuses. Right? And we know that he, he was not even 30 years old when he stopped the world economic meltdown. Solve the world economic issues. A slave. No, no, no. We, 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 want, we want economic freedom first before we can. We can. That's humanist approach. No humanist where, where they have the pyramid of me. Before I can think about other people, I must think about myself because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hierarchy. It's a hierarchy. God doesn't work like that. In fact, in fact, uh, let, me, let me not digress because I've got another clock. But then, one of the things that we must agree on, though, is that many of us are so great at helping strangers and we ignore our own families. Oh no, oh no! You, you, we, we, whenever we want to go to do some outreach, we look forward to your black plastic because it's got the best clothes that we give to strangers. When, whenever, whenever, whenever you see um, uh, job opportunities, you put them in the church WhatsApp group for strangers. But you've never shared your great clothes with your cousin. You've never shared that great opportunities. And then Paul then says, and you, I mean, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, it says, whoever does not take care of their relative is wedding in the normal room. You don't try to begin the normal as an American saying. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Can you imagine if all of us took care of our relatives who are poorer than us? How great the world will be. Because people come from families. The poor come from families. And in the family, there's somebody who will rather be. And why, why must we start with our families? It teaches us to be like God. You, you know, you know, you know, your family. Look, think, think about your brother and your sister. You do something nice for them in the morning. By evening, they are swearing at you. God says, start there because when I let you be like me. Because I allow you to wake up, not very well if you are planning to sit. And I still allow you to breathe. And if you forget that, I'm just passing by. That the issue of loving your neighbor is not yourself must then start in your house. In your house. There are Christians who are devoted, they, they, they fast, they fast, but the Bible says they are Western heathens if they don't take care of their religion. And of course, the Bible then says something wonderful. Proverbs 19, verse 17, it says, If you have the poor, you are lending to the Lord. And now, you know that even when banks want to lend you money, they don't trust you. Because you could lose a job, you could die, you could just ignore private numbers. You know, you know, I must give you, I must give you, you know, the thing of private numbers. Because sometimes the private number, you don't know whether 
is the interview I'm waiting for. Because they also call private numbers. Now the problem comes to ah, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it the debt or it's a potential? You know? so, so what I always say you must do, just, just do this. You hear whether it's a debt or whatever. And when it's a debt, just, just say it's meant to be a debt. Because why did that not the only so, so, so the point I'm making is that we can't be trusted, even when we lend people money. Have you noticed that when you lend somebody money, they are nice to when they ask for money. But when you are asking for your money back, you become enemies. It's not money. Even the way we go and ask for the money, even when we were young, we didn't call it by name. You know, your mother says you say, go, go, and they give, hey, I'm going And then the instruction is that, just check if there are strangers in the house. If there are strangers, just keep quiet. Don't embarrass me. I'm embarrassing you, but I want my mind. <laughs> but then the Bible then says, if you help the poor, you are lending to God. He doesn't run out of resources to repay. He's never going to be a bad debt. He's never going to be to raise a provision for dark good debt. So let's forget about it. Yeah. Now, let's go back now to what we are trying to talk about. Love your neighbor is the answer. Now the question, Two questions that will come up. One question comes up, but it is it is it is pregnant with another question. If you go, uh, I think it's Matthew 22 again, okay? um, or it's Luke. I can't remember now. But the, the, then one of the experts comes back to Jesus and says, "No, no, see, I was a teacher. Yeah, love your neighbors, love yourself." And you know, when someone asks a question that they think is the deepest question, yeah, but but who's my name? I'm just my. Yeah, who's my neighbor? Yeah, Jesus, I don't know who this. And then Jesus answers by telling a story. And I think inside the story, he's answering two questions. Who's your neighbor? And how do you love your neighbor as you love yourself? And I want us to dwell a little bit on that one. And then we're going to talk about the reality of limited resources. And unlimited people. And then how to use that. Now, let Jesus tell the story. And, and this story... Is about the Good Samaritan. You know the story. Good Samaritan, uh, there's, a, a, there's a person who was traveling on a notorious road. It's known that there are dogs there. And of course, um, he, he fell, he falls into some trouble. They rob him and they hurt him and they leave him half dead. And you know the story. There's a, there's a, there's a priest who pops by. He, the priest was his only thing to do. He doesn't even stop. And then of course, the, the, the Levite goes and, 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 and looks at this thing and says, he, he stops and he, he considers it, but then he, then he thinks about the inconvenience. Have hey, you noticed that sometimes when you want to help somebody, you realize, hey man, this thing needs more commitment than just a few cents at the, at the robot uh, or traffic light, because you guys are like, uh, you know that. And the robot said, no, robot said, no, okay, traffic light. And then he said, no, let me go. And then a good Samaritan stops. And of course, the Samaritan, because it's somebody who's not expected to do this. Have you noticed that the, the wealthy people that we've called heathens, that we've called greedy, are actually the ones who are helping the poor than the Christians? The least expected. But now, the question is who's my neighbor? And then, I suppose, how then do I love my neighbor the way I love myself? Then the first thing that Jesus is answering here is that your neighbor is anybody who is. And then how do I love them as I love myself? Look at what the Samaritan does. You can, you can, really, you can see from, from, from the way he takes care of the situation, or she, I don't know, the way he takes care of the situation that the good Samaritan was not necessarily a very poor person. He was, he was okay. I mean, he, he had transport as a donkey. He, he could pay for private hospitals and things like that. So look at how he does it. When he gets there, the Bible says he, he gets there and he has, he has compassion and he looks at the situation. But then, he doesn't ask questions. You know, many of us, when, when we're supposed to help somebody, we then diagnose the situation. Remember, remember the, 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 there was a, 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 a blind person and then the, the, the disciples were spending time analyzing the reason for the blindness. Was it, was it who's it here? Was it not sorting the blindness? And that's what we do. We, 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 we have a paralysis of analysis when it comes to poverty. 
We have all the theories we can write a thesis around why someone is poor. No, this this kids they smoke near open. That's why they're like this. These kids don't listen to their parents. That's why they're like this. We we have every every reason. What and that reason never gets us to help them. It's almost like we're coming up with excuses by being intelligent. He doesn't do that. He attends to the situation. He doesn't ask questions. He attends, but also he doesn't. He doesn't then say, because this place is no, oh, it's for criminals. What are these people doing here? You know, these people, they like building their sheds by the river and they know flooding every area. That's what we do. He doesn't do that. Now, what does it mean to love your neighbor as you love yourself? You see yourself in this person and say, you know, when you, you've messed up, and then the first thing somebody does, is to analyze your, your messing up. I already know. I've been, I've been condemning myself the whole time. Don't remind me. That's not part of helping me. So, what does he do? He gets off his own dog. He puts this man on the dog. And then he goes and he puts him in private care, private hospital. And then he pays in advance. <coughs> and then he says, many of us who, who go to private hospital, we know that they, they are... There are operations that the, 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 the hospital will have to confirm with your medical aid if they are fast to continue with the next procedure. What does this man do? He pays for even that next procedure just in case there's anything. He says you can you can carry on with any procedure, you don't have to ask for permission, I will take care of it. Loving your neighbor as you love yourself means that the things that you wish for yourself are what you deliver for this person. And that's what this, this fellow does. That's what this fellow does. Uh, I'm not sure if this will come back so that you can also participate. And therefore, loving your neighbor as you love yourself, what it also means that it also means that there may be some inconvenience in you helping out. It's more involving than just doing something with the remote control. That's what it is. But it also, and we know this, we know this because if you think about most people who are loving their neighbor as, as more than loving, as loving themselves, you can say that they make some sacrifices and they create some discomfort for themselves so that others can also be uplifted. You could think of, of, of Saul, when he, started really, when he started meeting Jesus, he then gave up the prestige of being known amongst the philosophers and being highly regarded. And then he even becomes a bright man because when he realized that there's more to do for other people than what I've been doing. You know this for, with, with Moses when he was already a prince and then he decides that if for me to help with injustice, I need to give up some comfort for myself so that we can have comfort together. That means that which I wish for myself, I must wish for other people, but it may include some sacrifice. But from the steps that I've shown you, some of the sacrifices don't even feel like sacrificing poverty is 1,000 real men. And of course, the greatest of them all who understood this concept of loving your neighbor as you love yourself was Jesus Christ himself who gave up being a God and a creator and became a creature and was, was, was being born by people he created, mingled amongst people he created, allowed the people he created to actually try and give him because of the love. And it's very important. And maybe that's why we don't do a lot because we realize how important and how inconvenient it is. Okay. I will just keep going. I will just keep going. But now, here's the challenge. So we understand what loving your neighbor and loving yourself as loving yourself is, right? And we're just passing by here. But there are some, there are some challenges with our approach sometimes in terms of how we actually deal with issues of charity and helping the poor. Even when we mean well, we sometimes create problems in our approach. And when I, when I say a few things around that, then I'm going to talk about limited resources and unlimited ones. And then we're going to close. Do you know that if you, if you, if you give somebody uh, something for, for the first time, right? Uh, let's say, I don't know, there's a, there's a person who's, who's, who's hungry, who stands in one corner the whole time, and you come with food, and you give them the food. Okay? So... No, they never expected it, and, and what you're going to get is appreciation. I really appreciate what you've done, because I didn't expect this. And then you do it for the second time. You do this every Wednesday. Okay? Then what you start creating is anticipation. Oh, no, that's the Wednesday. 
I was here, they, they gave me prayer. Next Wednesday, they gave me prayer. Let me, on Wednesday, let me just not move from this spot because there's anticipation, right? And then when you've created anticipation, you do it. Um, after you've done it three times, there's now expectation. On Wednesdays, we must get bread. We must get bread. When you've done it four times, you then create entitlement. They have to give us bread. In fact, in fact, to a point where change the four slices to three slices. Yeah, you know, you know, the time the time you catch up with the rest of the four slices, but they're not job. And then you do it more times, you actually create dependence. You then become the job. Are we, are we good? Okay, let me do this. Please don't start a song. I know you guys don't like silence. Please don't start a song. <laughs> silence is okay. <laughs> See the pictures because you won't remember you are used to your social media. <laughs> okay, uh, okay I, I'm gonna continue, otherwise uh, time time won't be around. And therefore, when you when you then keep creating that dependency, what then starts to happen is that you become the job. I'm not gonna look for work even though I'm skilled. I'm, I'm not talking about people who, who can't do anything for themselves. I'm talking about people who are able-bodied, who then start to depend on you because aid has created dependence. Now the question is, how then do we avoid this as humans? And I want to talk a little bit around that and then, uh, yeah, it's, it's fine. If you go to the book of John, John chapter 6, we know the story. Jesus, Jesus feeds the, the 5,000. And of course, that's just the men counted. And, and, and today we're not debating why the women are not counted. That's the men. So if you count the women, maybe there's a good number. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. Let's then do this. Wonderful. John chapter 6. We know the story. They, they, they are there and, and, and Christ is preaching a sermon and uh, it's lunchtime now. And, and one of the disciples, you know, you know there are some people who, who say a few things but they are throwing shade. Like, they just, you know, and this one disciple comes, go and read it. I forgot the name, I mean, I'm not that deep. But go and read it, it's there, I'll give you a little So one disciple says, hey man, the day is spent. In other words, it's late. In other words, hey, the sermon was done, my brother. <laughs> People should my neighbors the now. Let's just say it being thrown. And this is a this is a remote place. I, I, I don't know if Jesus who chose the venue, but hey, there's a bad choice. I mean there are no shops around here and, and, and therefore we can't really go and get food, there are no shops around here. And and of course they look at the issue of, of, of limited resources that you're going to need people to work, I think it's six months or a year to actually feed all these people. And then, of course, they identify a small, a small boy. Say a small boy because the boy suggests he's very small, but, but sometimes, as the closer people, they call us boys. So, this one's a small boy. <laughs> so, you know, you better, you better be culturally correct. Then the boy brings his, his large. And I, I've, I've listened to some, some people want to be thinking, no, 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 just five loaves, my brother, and a loaf has, 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 has 30 slices. And I mean, let's think about this thing. Do you think the boy was carrying two fish and five loaves? I mean, they're the proportions here. Yeah. No, no, just, just five slices, you know. So, so he brings his lunch. I always ask myself, though, this is 5,000 men who 
but couldn't come and they left their homes without any any lunch box to come and finish the young man's food. But anyway, the boy the boy gives his food. The boy gives his food. Let me let me let me take another ten minutes. The boy gives his food, and and the, the story we come back to the story when when we come to issue of limited resources in, in helping the poor. So he gives his food, and then they eat. And, and of course, the things that they left, and Jesus says that nothing be wasted, God has everything, and that, and that. Then next week they come back, they cry. Because, you know, they ate food, they said, like, you know, you know, each time this guy preaches, and it's a, a bit of, you know, a little bit out of town, there'll be food. Yeah, but that's, that's just, you know, have, have you been, you know, where, where I grew up sometimes, we'll, we'll, we'll type our arrival at funeral. So, you know, the lunch. <laughs> So these guys come back next week, but also they don't ask for the food directly. You, you, you must read it. They don't ask for the food directly. They say, they say, can you, before we can believe in you, can you perform the miracle of Moses? <laughs> you know the miracle of Moses, food was coming, there was manna. They want food. Jesus refuses. Because Jesus realizes that the first time when I gave them this food, go back to, to chapter 6 of John, the Bible says, when he saw that he had compassion, because he could realize that they can't do for themselves the world, because they are in a faraway place, they have no resources. Let me then react on compassion and provide for them. But if he does it again, he then creates dependency where he has friends, not believers. So he refuses to do that. So Christ is giving us the clue that we shouldn't create dependence. Shouldn't create dependence. When, when, when people are at church because uh, that's where they eat. So then how do we then approach it? If we don't create dependence, what then do we do? Micah chapter 6 verse 8 will tell us what do we do. And then we talk about limited resources, then we stop. Micah 6 chapter, chapter 8. There's just three words there. Act justly, love mercy, and uh, walk humbly. Three things. Three things that must be in our charity. Justice, mercy, and humility. Let's, let's dive on, on the little bit. Justice means, means, means fairness, it means, um, it means justness, fair play, fair-mindedness, equity, mark that, equity, equitableness, even-handedness, I can't pronounce the other one. In other words, in, in our approach of charity, we must do justice for the people we are helping. Mark that word, right? And then, mercy is about kindness, it's about help, it's about compassion, it is about favor, it is about blessing. Now, two things I must say. Mercy without justice. Mercy says that there is a disaster here. The shacks have burned. I can't say people must go and apply for jobs because I don't want to create dependence. Their IDs are burnt in there, so they can't go apply for jobs. There is an emergency, so I exercise mercy. I have compassion. Like Jesus really realized that they in a secluded place, they can't help themselves. He exercises compassion, then he performs the miracle. Right? So our charity must balance between mercy, which is responding to emergencies. But then we must graduate from emergency to empowerment. That's where justice comes in. We can't sit in a state of emergency, the water. Every time we do charity, it soaks and blanket. It soaks and blanket. It soaks and blanket. We don't graduate from emergency to empowerment. Soaks, blanket. Soaks, soaks. And we are part of it. We've got pictures for it. We've been collected a pastor to come and preach a sermon. Soaks, blanket. Nothing like against soaks and blanket, but that's emergency. So, how do you balance? Let me just give you a few things. Then I'm, I'm going to, so that we are, I don't waste your time. Mercy means that we take care of the crisis. It's short-term intervention because they can't do for themselves. Justice then says that I graduate you from emergency. I empower you. I don't do for, I do with. What, what does that mean? Then let's, say, let's say there's a community that doesn't have water. And then we, we, we create an intervention. We go and build a, a tent for them. But... We only call the adventist men, they must come in their fancy overalls, the Louis Vuitton, the Gucci overalls, to come and build a tent for them, while the community watches, because you guys are going to save the day. We are doing it for, not with. And then, six months later, the tent is broken. There's no ownership, because it was done for, not with. They call your church and say, hey, in Bombay, we put it. You gotta balance the two. Uh, justice 
also means that we create capacity. Think about it, think about it. I know, I know, I know that when all of you become successful, not all of you, most of you, when you become successful, you will then come here and, and give us a speech on 10 steps on how to be successful. As if you followed those 10 steps. <laughs> As if you were, you were conscious and you sat there in your poverty and you dreamt up these 10 steps. No, someone took a chance on you and you ignored that. Then, then, then justice says that also take a chance on other people. And that, because, because people are created in the image of God. The Bible says, Exodus 35, verse 35, I, I feel that with all men are skills. Someone just needs to give me a chance. Don't tell them about that. Step. No, I didn't sleep. I, 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 I. No, no, no. Someone took a chance on you. You had no experience. Someone says, come and do this. Let me see. That is justice. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. How are you successful? Someone took a chance on you. Why is this important? Subsidize, subsidize. You know, we, we, when we were younger, we are older now, it's documented over 30. It's, there's a long how many I can't wear a uniform. But, but when we were younger, when we were younger, we, we, I was very poor. I was very, 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 very poor. But if I tell my kids that, you know, you know kids can, can, can remind you that the situation was not that bad. Tell them you are poor, you are poor again. Now I was poor. So, 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 for food you, you were hunting. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I was supposed to hunting. So, so, but you were poor. <laughs> no, no, okay, maybe it wasn't that bad. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, uh, and, and we wanted to go to camp or we, 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 we needed money for transport and we would raise a prayer request inside church. The mothers, the fathers will call us that on Sunday, please come to my garden. There, there's something, and let me, let me say something about this. Let me say something about this issue of, 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 of doing with, not just doing for. Talk about that. Talk about that. Go and read the miracles. Oh, I'm out of time. Uh, that says, when you read the miracles, in the Bible, of course, not, not these ones. <laughs> okay, they are intense. When, when you read the miracles, you get to realize that, and miracles is when God is faithful in the supernatural. But you get to realize that those miracles, there's a partnership. While God is faithful in the supernatural, there's an expectation for us to be faithful in the natural. Let, let's take a few. Lazarus is dead. Resurrection Lazarus is, is a supernatural act. But uh, identifying this too, it's a natural thing for each me. You participate in the miracle. Be faithful in the natural. Roll the stone away, be faithful in the natural. The miracle has been done, but we must untie it, be faithful. They are part of the miracle. The, 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 there's a wedding in 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 in, in Canada, right in the right of of, of wine and, and Jesus is going to perform this miracle of turning water into wine, but that's Jesus being faithful in the supernatural. But bring, bring then the water filled. Participate. The, 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 I think it's first thing, chapter 4. The, the, the widow, almost said the, the widow who lost her husband, but of course, <laughs> that's what she is. Uh, she is left by a man who loved the Lord. But left them in debt. These men who love the Lord, but they're sitting in debt. Another story. And and then the miracle is is when she becomes the monopoly capitalist of the area around the cooking oil market, right? But he she must then go out to be faithful in the natural and collect from the neighbors. After the miracle is done, she must also be faithful in the natural and become a salesperson, go and sell. And then pay off your debt, I'm not going to do it for you. you. You see this pattern that God works together with us in our dealing with poverty. That's also. And then the verse that I love, the Leviticus chapter 19, verse 10. The Bible then says that when, when, when you harvest in your fields, do not harvest everything, leave some for the poor. Now the Bible didn't say that harvest for the poor, put it in a wood barrel, go and deliver it for them. It says, live for them so that they also participate in helping themselves. In helping themselves. Why is this important? When the Bible says, 
One of the things that makes us like God. Bible says in John 5, verse 17, my father is always working. And during creation, one of the things that we were given to show that we are like God was the gift of work, not jobs, work. Sometimes what we do for instead of doing with, we are actually seeing this person less of an image of God. Because they can't, they don't deserve the gift that they were born with of working. In fact, in fact, in fact, some of us, some of us, we remember the story of Peter uh, helping the man who couldn't walk. And, and of course, this man was here every week asking for money. This time around, he gets legs. Next week, you think the person was there? No, they have legs. That's what our charity must do. It must also give people legs so that next week they are standing on their own. But then some of us are only joy when others are on their knees. That's why our charity does not bring people up. Let's just be like us. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let's then end it. I, I, I have to end it this way. And then. Jesus then says, let nothing be wasted. Here's, here's the challenge that we have. Here's the challenge that we have. They realize there that they've got limited resources, but unlimited needs. And that's the situation that we find ourselves as a church. What COVID has done is that the rich became richer, but the poor became poorer. And therefore, when you come back to church, there's not enough offering. There's not enough people. Because people who are coming back to church have been battered by the economy. So the resources are limited, but the needs are many. Because there's unemployment, it has increased. There's July unrest that wiped out 50 billion from, 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 from the economy. Now you think that's theoretical. There's a factory that used to build phones and build appliances. They decided they're not going to do it. We are now importing them for the meet their jobs that are lost there. That's the church that must solve this thing. Limited resources. Limited resources. The flights also did something else. You know what's happening with the Ukraine war. Now, I must just say a few things, otherwise I'm going to, yeah, let's, let's do it this way. So one of the things that Jesus then says at the end, he says, because the resources are limited, let them not waste, let nothing be wasted, gather everything. There is something for those who lead the church, for those who manage the resources, that because the, limit, the resources are so limited, the issue of being accountable and making sure that you don't waste resources, it is so important. It is as important as asking the church to put money inside the coffer. Yeah. It is that important. And I'm not talking about stealing money, but I'm talking about wasting the money that the church has given. Very important. But because of time, I'm not going to get too much into that. Let me just, I'm, I'm, I'm ending here. We can talk about that another time. Another time. But lastly, lastly, this one is really the last one. What do you think made the young boy to give his life. This life is for him. But he gives it to Jesus. What do you think makes somebody who has limited resources to still contribute to a cause? The boy saw a vision. A vision that was bigger than himself. And he saw a Jesus who can be trusted to manage these resources so well. After what the boy saw Jesus do, the ball will give again. The other challenge that I'm going to say is that while the resources are limited, when there's a vision and there's trust, they multiply and the people who give continue giving because they can see a vision. God bless you.